Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for our first official lightning webinar with RSET. And for this uh, training, we are focusing on a new sensor, EcoStress, that is on board the International Space Station. And um, we're doing things a little differently. Uh, we have only one session uh, this for this training. Um, but it will be available in the same format that we have all of our other trainings. Um, for this training, I am really honored to uh, have two guest speakers with us today um, who are experts in eco-stress. Uh, we have Christine Lee uh, from JPL, who is a research scientist who has worked with the eco-stress data. And we have Cole Craybell from um, the Land Processes Distributed Active Archive Center, and he is a contractor um, for the USGS. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. As I mentioned, um, things are formatted a little differently for this training. We just have one one hour long session. Um, the recording and the presentation will be found at the training website uh, shown here. There will be no homework or certificate. Um, so uh, no need to worry about uh, completing any homework or, or obtaining a certificate of completion. We will have time at the end of today's session for question and answer. And um, we will be joined for by our guest speakers uh, during the um, question and answer session as well. So you can ask them things that you um, may not have, have learned or have questions about during the session today. Uh, we will also post the um, question and answer document to the website um, about a day or two after we complete the training. So if um, you want clarification on your question, you can come back to the document and take a look at it there. Um, additionally, if you don't get your question answered, you can email myself or my colleague Juan Torres Perez at our email addresses listed there, and um, we can direct you in the, the right uh, direction. So for today's session, um, first Christine will be providing an overview of what EcoStress is, what the data are, um, the types of products that are available, and then provide you all with a couple case study examples to really get you um, a sense of how to use the data um, for any application that you might be interested in. Um, and then Cole will be providing us an introduction to the LPDAC and a really great demonstration of the data and how to access it on a peers and then how to display it in a um, GIS type system. Um, and then will be followed, as I mentioned, by the um, question and answer session. So first, um, I would like to hand it over to uh, Christine Lee with JPL, who will be providing you an overview of EcoStress. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Christine Lee, and I am really excited to be able to tell you a bit about EcoStress the Ecosystem Spaceborne Thermal Radiometer Experiment on Space Station. Uh, I wanted to uh, thank RSET for hosting this lightning session. Um, in my current role with EcoStress, I am the applications lead for the project. And I was also recently selected um, as a PI for the science and applications team. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for taking the time to uh, learn more about the, the mission and how you can use our data. So EcoStress was selected as an Earth Ventures instrument project in 2014 to uh, study plant health at higher spatial and temporal resolution, resolution using a multispectral thermal radiometer instrument that is now currently installed on the International Space Station. Uh, as part of our mission deliverables, we would deliver level one through level four products, which I will tell you about in upcoming slides. Uh, we've been acquiring data since August 2018 and are currently on an extended mission through at least August 2020. And this is actually a first for the Earth Ventures class. 
Um, and so one difference between Earth Ventures class missions is that um, we are a cost capped mission, so we're on a very tight budget, um, but we are still tasked to do uh, really interesting science and applications. Uh, and I would love to share more about that with you in the next slides. EgoStress is really focused on understanding uh, three main science and applications questions related to vegetation health from the vantage point of the International Space Station. Uh, first, we are interested in understanding on a global scale how plants are responding to changes in water availability. Um, and so we are looking at different uh, climate sensitive biomes uh, across the globe in order to do this. We are also really interested in understanding the diurnal variability of evapotranspiration. And we, to do this, we are leveraging the unique precessing orbit of the ISS, which acquires data at different times of day. And I will talk a little bit more about that as well. And then our third science and applications objective is focused on how we can use this uh, understanding and these data to support agricultural water users, um, including uh, supporting advanced monitoring of uh, drought onset and its impact. And so we are going to be able to address these questions by uh, using a variety of data products that our project is currently generating. Um, we are providing most of these products at a 70 meter by 70 meter pixel uh, spatial resolution. Um, in general, the ISS is acquiring data um, in our target areas on at least a weekly basis, um, oftentimes more frequently than that. And we're also providing data products all the way up to level four. Um, and level two, land surface temperature and emissivity being our uh, first uh, kind of primary geophysical parameter um, that we are then building the level three and four products um, on top of. Uh, land surface temperature, along with other ancillary data, are used to derive evapotranspiration. And we're doing this uh, using two different uh, evapotranspiration models. Uh, the first is PTJPL, which has been applied on both regional and global scales. Um, and has done really well on, on the global scale. And Alexi, which is an ET model that uh, has been primarily used to uh, study agricultural uh, environments. Uh, the level three and level four products will, are the primary products that will be used to address those three mission science and applications objectives that were listed in the previous slide. And so how will we use these data products to address these questions? And what are some of the novel aspects of the eco-stress eco system that enables this work? And so uh, in the previous slide, we noted that uh, we have two level four products, evaporative stress index and water use efficiency. And those two variables can be used to help us understand uh, questions one and three um, on the slide. Um, and that uh, helps us characterize how plants are responding to changes in water availability and um, looking at carbon uptake. Um, and the evaporative stress index can be uh, used as an earlier warning to uh, drought onset and impacts. Uh, and we want to uh, tailor this information to support agricultural uh, water users. And then, of course, evapotranspiration. Um, is the product that will be used to address the science, uh, the second science question listed here. So our our base kind of geophysical product, um, as I mentioned, is the land surface temperature and emissivity products, which is the variable that we are going to use to uh, better understand plant stress. So if you were to compare a natural color Im image at comparable spatial resolution in this area shown here, um, the Salton Sea, um, which is uh, a water body that is actually uh, uh, human-made and comprised of agricultural drainage and it's, uh, in Southern California. You can actually see the distribution of agricultural plots um, to the southeast of Salton Sea uh, in this region. Um, and you could actually see the outline and the delineation of these different fields. 
But what you can't see in that natural color image is whether any of these plots are water stressed or not. And in the right uh, image using LST or land surface temperature, we can actually begin to compare vegetation differences uh, and condition, which can then be translated to uh, evapotranspiration um, at our level three products and beyond. And so what is evapotranspiration exactly? Uh, evapotranspiration, or ET, is essentially the amount of water that is being evaporated and transpired from the Earth's surface into the atmosphere. Plants that have sufficient water are able to respire a process by which they take CO2 and convert it into plant mass, also known as photosynthesis, and they emit water as a byproduct. Uh, water that is in the surrounding soils can also be evaporated into the atmosphere, um, as well as water bodies, and this water flux is what is captured in this term, evapotranspiration. ET is a, a key variable that allows us to essentially use plants as our laboratory for understanding how changes in the carbon and water cycle are occurring, uh, and then trying to scale this to uh, the global scale. Um, it also allows us to uh, understand the energy it takes that, to drive these processes. Uh, when a plant, healthy plant is transpiring, it is releasing water as a byproduct, which has a co-benefit of keeping the plant at a favorable cooler temperature. When a plant does not have sufficient water, it will actually shut down and close its stomata to try and prevent any additional water losses. And when this happens, uh, we lose that cooling effect that occurs when it's transpiring water and the plant begins to heat up. And this is what we can detect from uh, using EcoStress and other thermal uh, instruments. Um, and we can actually help, this data can actually help us uh, detect when this crossover occurs um, because we are sampling at different times of day. So here's an example of how evapotranspiration can vary throughout the day for a plant that started off uh, with enough water and then was uh, and then experienced water stress as we hit uh, those hotter temperatures in the midday. So in the morning when temperatures are cooler and if there is sufficient water, uh, the plant may be able to continue photosynthesizing, which we can then uh, infer uh, uh, is occurring using evapotranspiration. Um, and as we cross over into a hotter phase of day, uh, if there is not sufficient water available, uh, we are able to detect the plant um, shutting down its photosynthesizing process. Um, and this is reflected as a dip in uh, ET um, or an increase in, uh, in temperature. If we notice this dip, we can then apply water uh, and once sufficiently watered, the plant is actually able to recover quickly. Um, this can all be uh, detected, and if we have that information early enough, we can all we can respond quickly enough before the plant um, might become uh, the plant might shut down in a way that's irreversible, or b before the plant has actually begun to brown. So EcoStress has a fairly large swath at 400 kilometers and um, higher spatial resolution at about 70 meters by 70 meters. As I mentioned previously, we're sampling at approximately every three to five days over the continental US. Um, and for our other kind of priority hotspots and CalBAL uh, sites, we are sampling at at least uh, weekly or less. Um, at this resolution, we are able to resolve a lot of detail in land features, including many agricultural fields. And so this image provided by uh, our science lead, Dr. Josh Fisher, um, was acquired over Garden City, Kansas, of fields that are watered using pivot irrigation. Um, and not only are you able to detect uh, the delineation, the delineated areas of these fields, um, because this is an ET uh, image, you're actually also able to see the variable uh, ET, instantaneous ET um, throughout these different fields. And this difference, these differences can then be linked 
to things like uh, crop type and uh, water availability and perhaps be used to support uh, those who are managing these fields. Uh, and uh, if there are fields that um, appear to be uh, water stressed, um, they can respond uh, accordingly. And so eco-stress data really gives us this insight into uh, plot scale plant water use in a level of uh, detail that has never been um, available before um, at both spatial, temporal, and spectral resolution. And so in addition to uh, agricultural water use and plant stress, we, as we mentioned, we are interested in how plants and vegetation all over the world are responding to changes in water availability. And so uh, in combination of looking at um, plant water use in agricultural areas, we can also look at um, other types of terrestrial ecosystems as well and seeing what their response is to water availability. Here's an example of um, one of our level four products, which is water use efficiency, um, which compares um, the ratio of carbon uptake to evapotranspiration, and this was acquired over the Amazon. And you can actually see a very strong water use efficiency gradient um, that was resolved using uh, eco-stress data as well as um, another ancillary uh, primary productivity product um, over this region. Uh, we were also able to, um, because of our um, fairly frequent temporal uh, revisit um, frequency, we're also able to um, basically see if EcoStress has been able to help capture um, water use and vegetation status um, in response to uh, uh, kind of trending um, high, higher priority uh, issues that are occurring uh, in the press or noticed by the press, for example. Um, in this image, we're looking at um, an ongoing drought um, that was detected using, uh, again, ESI um, over the region of Costa Rica. Um, in February of 2019. And so you can see these patches of very high evaporative stress occurring throughout the region. Um, and through our partnerships with other colleagues working in Costa Rica, we're able to help so potentially support uh, managers in this area in utilizing this data. And so EcoStress, as I mentioned, leverages the variable overpass uh, times of the ISS to study how ET varies at different times of day. Um, I've put a, a heart around where EcoStress is currently installed on the International Space Station. Um, and so one unique um, aspect of being installed in one of these end spots on the um, external module is that they are Wi-Fi enabled. And so all of our data transfer to the ISS is um, by a Wi-Fi connection, which um, allowed us to actually um, uh, increase our um, the number of uh, scenes that were acquired um, as we progressed throughout the project. And so because of the variable overpass time, we are now able to acquire uh, data of the same area at different times of day. And so in this example, um, we are looking at pivot irrigation fields in the Nile Delta in both the morning and afternoon. And we can actually see in this image uh, the increase in um, ET occurring between the morning and afternoon um, time points, uh, which may mean that they uh, those fields that are turning a deeper blue were actually watered at some point um, between the morning and afternoon, uh, and then res res being reflected in higher rates of evapotranspiration. And so we are using EcoStress to advance understanding of how ET changes throughout the day, and then linking this to, um, uh, linking this to plant health. And so one critical component of the work that we're doing, um, because it is remote sensing, is that we're tying all of this data to uh, multiple FluxNet sites all around the world. I think we're close to 100 different FluxNet stations that are basically uh, what we use to um, 
compare our remotely sensed-based uh, evapotranspiration estimates to ground-based estimates. And so uh, the orange bar reflects uh, ET estimates that were derived using FlexNet stations on the ground, and then the blue dots represent EcoStress uh, ET estimates at different times of day. Um, and so uh, in scaling this to all of the different uh, sites that we have across the world, and this one being one prime example, um, we're seeing that we're actually able to track the diurnal changes in ET fairly well, which we were very pleased to see. We can see an example of how um, our co-investigators at the U.S. Department of Agriculture is using EcoStress in combination with Landsat to improve the temporal resolution in ET assessments uh, in different agricultural areas. Um, our co colleagues at the USDA are working with a wide variety of uh, agricultural uh, partners, um, both in the public and private sectors, um, and able to provide uh, this improved time series of ET um, to those users uh, to support better irrigation, improved irrigation practices, and understanding of uh, crop water use and stress. And so I've talked primarily about the different ways that we've been using EcoStress data to advance um, our knowledge of plant water use um, and vegetation health, um, as well as how we might use that data to support agricultural water users. Um, but there are a variety of other ways that EcoStress data could uh, potentially be used to advance both science and applications investigations. And so I'll talk briefly about a few of them here. Um, here's an example of uh, EcoStress uh, being able to um, detect um, the ongoing wildfires occurring in the Amazon. Um, and so you could see these hot spots where um, we've actually saturated in our thermal bands, um, but it gives us a sense of where the the spatial distribution and location of where these fires are ongoing. Uh, here's an example of using uh, our land surface temperature product um, uh, as sea surface temperature off the coast of southern, uh, central and southern California to uh, track coastal upwelling zones. Um, so you can really see some of these interesting uh, upwelling features along the California coast. And in a recently selected science team project, they will be linking this with uh, biodiversity indices in this, in this area. Uh, in a recently published uh, study um, led by uh, one of our science team members, Dr. Glenn Hulley, um, he was able to uh, use EcoStress in combination with MODIS to uh, assess urban heat islands um, in the uh, Los Angeles County area. Uh, and he was doing this in combination with, um, uh, or in partnership with uh, the county's sustainability office and um, public health department. And so th because EcoStress, again, is able to acquire at different times of day, he was able to um, improve our understanding of how this area was recovering um, uh, during uh, you know, uh, peak daytime heat wave uh, conditions uh, in the evenings. Uh, and so one critical element about um, urban heat islands and their potential impact on public health is that it's not only the daytime temperatures that uh, are a huge issue, but actually uh, the nighttime temperatures as well. Um, because nighttime is when uh, uh, especially vulnerable populations are able to recover um, from the uh, high daytime temperatures. And um, what they found here was that this area was not cooling off um, to a level where um, that recovery period was really sufficient. Um, and so EcoStress can be used to better understand um, uh, this uh, distribution of urban heat 
um, as well as support public health departments in how they might uh, respond and manage, for example, deployment of resources uh, in response to these events. And so this is the project that I'm working on. I'll just uh, mention it briefly. So we're interested in looking at uh, water surface temperature in, um, in areas that are uh, have these co-benefits of um, being water supply as well as ecosystems. Um, and so in our project in California, we're primarily focused on the California Bay Delta, which is where a lot of California's water is uh, transited um, before it goes to Central Valley in Southern California. Um, but there are a number of vulnerable uh, species uh, that uh, use the Delta as their, as their homes. Um, and in this case, the Delta smelt is um, one species, fish species, that has um, been in severe decline for, uh, for quite a while now, um, in part because of the way we've altered the Delta and impacted um, things like uh, the uh, hydrology, which then impacts uh, the temperature conditions. Um, and it's actually been projected that the number of uh, days that could cause mortality in these fish is going to be increasing into the future. And so we're using eco-stress data to better understand the variability of uh, te water temperature conditions in relation to the delta smelt and other species in this region. And using that to help inform uh, restoration activities as well as um, flow actions that could try that could then be used to improve uh, the generation of thermal refuges um, in this region. And so uh, currently, EcoStress has over 260 members in our community of practice. These science and applications uh, uh, investigators were um, initially part of our early adopters program and were given access to EcoStress data prior to a full um, public release at the LPDAC. Um, and this was a really great mechanism for us to uh, engage with the community as well as hear the community's feedback on um, data quality issues um, and desired tools and services that would make it easier for them to um, work with the data and analyze the data. Um, and so we still have a pretty active uh, community of practice um, and we uh, primarily through the use of a Slack channel and so we encourage um, any other scientists or uh, applied scientists who are interested in working with EcoStress data to join the community of practice and the Slack channel. Um, we've really thought of it as a great resource for interfacing um, with uh, a wide variety of science and applications users. Um, and so you can join by visiting that link. Uh, EcoStress also recently selected 15 new members to join the Science and Applications team family um, through a ROSES call. Um, the selections were announced fairly recently, I, I believe in October. And it's quite a diverse crew that we have um, who will be embarking on studies to use EcoStress data for uh, agriculture, ecosystems, water quality, coastal systems, and aquaculture public health and urban heat, um, geothermal resources, and wildfire impact studies. And so if you're interested in um, getting um, more information about uh, the selected projects, you can visit this link here. EcoStress uh, and all of the work that has um, been done through both EcoStress and um, uh, through EcoStress can feed directly into um, our future as we look towards the next set of NASA Earth Science missions um, that were uh, prioritized in the recent decadal survey that was released. And so um, one of the four um, designated observables, or you can think of them as mission concepts, um, includes the surface biology and geology designated observable, which um, envisions a, a combined set of measurements that would um, acquire data in the visible to shortwave infrared um, as an imaging spectrometer, as well as a multispectral thermal instrument. Um, and these uh, combined sets of measurements are 
are the current, uh, it is thought that these measurements can be used to address a very wide variety of critical uh, terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems questions, as well as um, solid earth uh, science and applications questions as well. Um, and in this kind of uh, paradigm of pursuing this mission study, we are integrating applications uh, needs early on, um, even at this early mission formulation stage. And so if you're interested in learning more about the SBG uh, designated observable and study, you can uh, contact, uh, you can visit our website at sbg.jpl.nasa.gov. Um, or contact us at this email that's listed here. Uh, so thank you everyone for um, joining us again. Um, at this point, I would like to hand it over to my colleague Cole Crabel at uh, the Land Processes DAC, which is where um, EcoStress data is now um, publicly available and discoverable. Um, and he is going to walk through some of the tools that they have developed to help facilitate the use and subsetting of EcoStress data. Thanks, Christine. Hello, everyone. My name is Cole Crable, and I am a remote sensing scientist working as a contractor to NASA's Land Processes Distributed Active Archive Center, or LPDAC. I'm going to give you all an introduction to the LPDAC and EcoStress data products, and then show you all some resources for working with EcoStress data. NASA's Land Processes Distributed Active Archive Center is located in Sioux Falls, South Dakota at the USGS Aero Center. We are one of the NASA EOSIS DACs, focusing primarily on archiving and distributing NASA's land remote sensing products. In addition to archiving and distributing NASA's land remote sensing products, the LPDAC also provides services and support in order to advance the access, understanding, and use of data for large and diverse user communities. Today we are going to focus on EcoStress, but I did want to mention the other data collections currently archived and distributed by the LPDAC, including SMPP NASA Beers products, Terra and Aqua Modus products, and Terra Aster products, as well as products funded by NASA PIs and community products. EcoStress was launched on June 29, 2018, and data are available from July 2018 to the present. Spatially, EcoStress covers the conterminous United States, 10 key biomes and agricultural zones, and around a dozen selected FluxNet sites. The data are provided at 70 meter resolution except for the products produced by the USDA, which are available at 30 meter resolution. The temporal resolution is variable depending on the orbit of the International Space Station, but generally you can expect to have observations every one to five days over the aforementioned areas. EcoStress is a multispectral thermal radiometer and as such has five bands spanning the thermal infrared, which was reduced to three bands in May of 2019. The data are archived as SWA files, although be on the lookout for gridded higher level products to be made available in 2020. They are made available as HDF5 files, and there are currently 12 products available by the LPDAC. We are expecting two additional products by the end of 2019, and keep an eye out for the gridded products coming in 2020. EcoStress products are divided into four different levels. Level one products include the geolocation parameters and calibrated radiance. There's also a resampled radiance product that is produced by resampling the swath radiance data using the geolocation arrays from the Eco1D Geo products. The level one radiance product is used to generate the level two products, including land surface temperature and emissivity, and a cloud mass. In turn, these are used to derive the level three evapotranspiration products and ancillary data QA flags, and the level four evaporative stress index and water use efficiency products. As I mentioned earlier, keep an eye out for the new JPL produced evapotranspiration and ESI products using the Dyselexi algorithm. And in 2020, there will be level two through level four gridded products released. 
So that is an overview of the EcoStress data available from the LPDAC. Now I want to show you all some useful resources for getting started with EcoStress data. Beginning with the peers, or the application for extracting and exploring analysis-ready samples. Appears is an easy-to-use web application interface for subsetting data spatially, temporally, and by band or layer. Appears also provides some basic output options to help you spend less time searching for, downloading, and processing data, and more time focusing on using the analysis-ready outputs for your research or application needs. Since EcoStress products are natively stored as swath data, Appears also provides swath to grid resampling, exporting the data you request as gridded geotiffs available in your desired output projection. Appears also provides interactive visualizations of the data for your region of interest, including decoded quality information. So before I dive into a live demo of Appears, I wanted to set the stage with a real-world use case example to use as the framework for submitting an appears request for EcoStress data. This use case comes from a NASA Develop project that is being conducted in collaboration with the Tennessee Valley Authority. Here we have staff from the TVA Hydrothermal Group who are tasked with monitoring water temperatures downstream from nuclear power plants to ensure that those temperatures meet federal regulations. Their region of interest includes upstream and downstream locations from the TVA's three nuclear power plants in Tennessee and Alabama. One of the reasons why they want to enhance monitoring is that recently they have expanded power production, which could potentially be increasing river temperatures via thermal discharge into the Tennessee River, which could potentially harm fluvial ecosystems. For this project, they're looking at supplementing their models with additional products that can assess the water surface temperature before and after expansion at upstream and downstream locations using a variety of different thermal data products. And here we're going to focus primarily on EcoStress land surface temperature. Now I will show you all how to navigate the LPDAC website to find EcoStress land surface temperature products and also access the peers from there. So here we can see the LPDAC website. In March of 2019, we released our newly revamped website, which you can see here. So if you haven't checked out our website in a while, I would definitely recommend um, logging in and seeing what it looks like. I'm going to direct your attention to the top here. And we're gonna hover over this data dropdown and then move to search data catalog. The search data catalog will allow you to browse all of the different products that are archived and distributed from the LPDAC. You can see here, you can type in a keyword. Here, I'm gonna actually query by collection. And here we can see that there are 12 EcoStress products available. Now, some of you might prefer to look in list view, um, similar to our old website. So you can go ahead and query to the list view. And here we get all 12 of the EcoStress products listed. Today, we're gonna to focus primarily on the EcoStress land surface temperature and emissivity level two product. Go ahead and click in there. So this will bring the product up the product's DOI landing page where you can see a description of the product, characteristics at the collection and granule level, and then even down to the specific data set level. Directing your attention back to the top here, there's also useful information like the documentation for the product, how to cite the data that you use, and then if we click on tools, the first thing I'll show you are data prep scripts, which I will introduce at the end of the presentation that we use to start accessing EcoStress data. But let's go ahead and click on Appears. So this will take you to the Appears tool page, and then we can go ahead and launch Appears. So this is the Appears landing page. The first thing I'm going to direct your attention to is in the upper right-hand corner. You will need to sign in using a NASA Earth Data login. If you don't already have one, um, it's free and easy to get signed up, and you will need it to use either Appears or access EcoStress data in any other manner. Next, I will direct your attention to the Help menu. If I go through anything too quickly today or there's something that I don't cover in terms of features or functionality, definitely would recommend checking out the Appears documentation that will contain step-by-step -step guide for how to use everything available in Appears. I did also want to mention our API. Appears has a publicly available API 
Uh, we're not going to cover it in today's presentation, but if you are interested in accessing a peer services programmatically via command line or Python or R calls, definitely check out the API documentation to get started. I am going to click on the available products page here. So in addition to the EcoStress products that are available in Appears, we also have other LPDAC products, including MODIS and Veers, and also from collaborating federal archives, including the Landsat Analysis Ready Data Surface Reflectance, which is made available by the USGS, they met uh, weather parameters, which are made available by the ORNL DAC, and soil moisture active passive, which is made available by the National Snow and Ice Data Center DAC. All right, without further ado, I will show you guys how to actually make an extraction for EcoStress data in Appears. So if you click on this extract menu, you'll see that there are options to perform a point sample or an area sample. So a point sample would be specific point locations using geographic lat latitude and longitude coordinates for things like, say, a flux tower or your specific point of interest. However, since for our use case, we're interested in looking at water temperatures over the entire Tennessee River, we want to actually make an area sample. So this will take you to an intermediate page where there are three options. You can either start a new request from scratch, you can copy a previous request, or you can upload a request JSON file that contains parameters for the request you'd like to submit. For today's demo, we're going to go ahead and start a new request. First things first, we'll want to submit a name. Let's call this EcoStress demo. Okay, so now there's three main subsetting techniques that we need in order to extract the data that we're interested in. Start with the spatial subsetting aspect. So here you can see we have a map. If you prefer to simply draw a polygon or a bounding box, you can use the tools here. Let's say if we just wanted all EcoStress data for the state of Alabama, you could draw a bounding box like so. However, since I have a specific use case and region of interest, I'm going to actually drag and drop a zipped shape file containing boundary of the Tennessee River from around Florence, Alabama to Huntsville, Alabama. You could also use a GeoJSON and upload that if you, that's your preferred file format. And I did want to mention here, while this is only a single feature that you see here, if you had a multi-feature polygon, you could also upload that into a peers. Say, for example, different sections of the uh, Tennessee River, you could do that as well. So now that we have our spatial subset, we can move on to our temporal subset. You can see here, you can use the calendar to navigate to the dates that you would like to request. So I know that EcoStress was launched in July of 2018. So I can go ahead and say, all right, I want to retrieve all the EcoStress data from July of 2018. And then you can also type a date directly into the box if you prefer. So let's say we'll ask for data from July 2018 all the way to uh, October 2019. Okay, so now we have our spatial subset, our temporal subset, and now we just need to select the specific product and layers that we're interested in. So if you click on this search for a product box here, there's a couple of different ways you can search for the data you're interested in. You could either type the sensor like EcoStress, or you could type in land surface temperature or any type of keyword, or if you know the product short name, you could look for that as well. So here I'm going to type in EcoStress, and what you'll see here are all the available EcoStress products in a peer. I click into this product. Um, one thing that is nice, you can see the product short name, spatial resolution, the temporal resolution, and then the dates that the product is available for. Okay, so when I click into the product, I mentioned earlier that there's, these are stored in a hierarchical data format. So you'll see that there are all kinds of different data sets within the actual LST product. And we maybe don't want to download all of those for our specific use case. That's another thing that's nice about Appears is that instead of having to download the entire file, you can just pluck out the specific data sets that we are interested in. Um, if you're unsure about the name of a data set and what that means, you can click on this eye icon here. So here we can see this data set is land service temperature. You can see useful information like the units are in Kelvin. And also this quality layer here shows us that there's a linked quality layer. So in Appears, whether you ask for quality data or not, we always 
um, retrieve the quality information associated with any layers you've requested, and we give you that information both as a visualization and in the output files as well. Take quality very seriously. Okay, so we have our LST layer. If you click on it, it should show up in your selected layers. And then just to show you guys another product that's available in Appears, um, let's see, we can search by keyword here now. And let's go ahead and grab the Mod 11A1, which is a daily land surface temperature product. And I'm gonna grab the LST Night. So here we have a couple different uh, LST layers in order to look at the surface temperature of water um, on the Tennessee River. Okay, we have our spatial subset, our temporal subset, and our banner layer subset. Now there are just a couple of key uh, output options that we'll need to select in order to complete our request. So as I mentioned, with EcoStress products, they're natively stored as swaths. And so we actually have to, on the back end of a peers, do resampling using the, the latitude and longitude arrays from the geolocation product. And so because of that, we actually um, only allow users to select the GeoTIFF for EcoStress request and appears. However, if you were looking for a different product like MODIS, you could select the NetCDF4 output option as well. But since we're looking at EcoStress, we'll select GeoTIFF. And then as far as projection goes, appears will either allow you to leave all the data that you've requested in its uh, native projection or source projection, or you can reproject to this short list provided here. Um, so for EcoStress, when we perform the swap to grid resampling, we define the native projection as simply a geographic uh, coordinate reference system. So let's go ahead and select that here. And this will also take the MODIS data that's stored in sinusoidal format and reproject it to geographic. This will allow us to use the EcoStress and MODIS data together in the same coordinate reference system. All right, so once we have all of our parameters filled out, we can go ahead and click Submit. You should see a green banner appear at the top of the screen notifying you of a successful request submission. Once your request is completed, Appears will send you an email to the email address you provided for your NASA Earth Data login account that will send you a link to, to download or visualize the contents of your request. Uh, in the interest of time today, I'm going to show you guys a request that I submitted uh, yesterday. So now if we go to this Explore menu here, the Explore menu is like a table or a database of all of your peers' requests. Um, one thing I did want to direct your attention to is this status column is quite useful. So here you can see is the request that we just submitted. You can see that it's pending. Um, once an appears worker picks that up, this status will change the processing. It will actually give you a percentage um, complete, which is really nice for longer running requests so that you know about when that request will finish processing. All right, so you can see once a request is completed, categorized as done, and what we can do here is either view the contents of the request or download the contents of the request. So I'm going to show you guys how to view the contents first. This will bring up Appears View Area Sample page. These are interactive visualizations that you can look at before you ever even download your first EcoStress theme. Um, you'll notice that you can toggle by feature and by layer. So here we only have the single feature looking at the Tennessee River. Um, however, if you had a multi-feature polygon as your input, you would see different features appear here and you could toggle your uh, visualizations between them. All right, and then by layer, so you can see here we have two different layers that we've requested. So you can decide which layer you'd like to visualize. So moving down, what you'll see is a box plot time series. So each box plot is going to show the distribution of land surface temperature values for your region of interest. Um, these are interactive, so you can hover over them. You could zoom to a specific time period of interest. So here we can see that on February 17, 2019, our median uh, land surface temperature was 237 Kelvin. All right, you can also toggle by year. Let's say we just wanted to look at EcoStress data for 2019. And you can even update the y-axis values. So here, let's see, let's try 400 to 150 Kelvin. And that should update our visualization as well. So you can get a better idea of the trends in the, the water surface temperature here. What you'll notice below are the decoded quality information for each observation. 
let's say we notice that this observation from October 31st looks a bit low compared to the previous observations. If we hover over the stack bar chart here, this is going to give us the distribution of values, uh, quality values, including the decoded quality information. So here we can see that 90% of this observation was classified as pixel produced, but cloud detected. So this already gives us an idea that maybe that observation isn't going to be quite useful for our TVA use case example. All right, so we can go ahead and reset our visualization here. And then quickly, I will just show you guys what the MODIS daily land service temperature product looks like. So here you can see with the daily uh, resolution of MODIS, you definitely start to see the seasonality of the water surface temperature, albeit this is at a coarser resolution. So here you're at one kilometer resolution. Okay, so that is how to visualize EcoStress data in appears. I'm going to move back to the Explore menu now. And now we're going to take a look at how to download the contents of your request. So you'll see up top we have all these supporting files. These include things like ISO 19115 compliant metadata, uh, a granule list that will contain links to all the source data that was used to compile your request, a README with some useful information, uh, this JSON file that I mentioned earlier, this will include all the specific parameters that you requested in your appears request. This is really good for reproducibility. So you could download this JSON file, share it with a colleague, and then they could submit the exact same request. And then you see a list of CSV files here, which include quality lookup tables and summary statistics. And so the summary statistics are all of the statistics that were used to generate the visualizations that we just looked at. We have exported those as CSV files. So if you wanted to look at, say, the, the mean or the median or the range of values by observation for your region of interest, before you ever even download the data, you can do that in the CSV file. OK, so then down below, we have our actual output data files. If you just wanted to download one, you could click directly on the link. Um, you could also toggle and maybe do like a shift. And there you can select a subset of data to download or I like this select all feature. So if you're someone who wants to bulk download all of your, your output files, you could select all. What's nice is it tells you how many files you're gonna download and how large that will be. And then if you click on this download dropdown, you can see there are a couple options. You can either download the files um, directly in the web browser. This will um, start bulk downloading directly in your web browser, or I prefer to use the save download list which will export a text file containing links to all of these files that you've selected. And then you could use like wget or curl commands um, in order to rapidly download all of those files. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to show you guys was what the actual output files look like. So here, what you can see, if you zoom the layer. In QGIS, I brought in my shape file that I used to submit my request and then downloaded an actual GeoTIFF output and here I've actually scaled it into Fahrenheit, so a little bit more meaningful to most of us than Kelvin. And so let's go ahead and turn the shape file off. You can see that it's clipped directly to our boundaries. And what we're looking at here is the Tennessee River from around Florence to just south of Huntsville. So if I zoom in here, what you'll see is here's the Browns Ferry Nuclear Power Plant, one of the three power plants that the TVA is looking at. And what you'll notice is that in shades of red, we have higher um, land surface temperature being detected. So I should mention here to orient you guys, the water here is flowing from the right to the left. So here we can see in kind of shades of yellow and blue, we have some cooler water temperature um, upstream from the nuclear power plant compared to the discharge area directly downstream where we're definitely seeing increased water temperatures. And that's kind of continuing all the way down towards Florence. So if we zoom back out, another thing that's great about EcoStress is the higher resolution being 70 meters. Even where there are very thin sections of the river, we're still able to get a good reading on the land surface temperature of the water here. And so based on this observation, it does look like there's definitely um, cooler water temperatures upstream and then warmer temperatures downstream from the nuclear power plant. Okay. Here, I just wanted to give you guys some additional resources for working with EcoStress data. If you would rather download the raw SWOT data on your own, we have a data prep script 
which is a command line executable Python script that will perform the swath per grid resampling for each swath scene and export each layer as GeoTIFF. We also have a variety of e-learning resources and materials which can be found at the link provided. These include a Jupyter Notebook tutorial, workshop materials from a workshop that was conducted at the 2019 EcoStress Science Team meeting, and a previous NASA Earth Data webinar about EcoStress. All of these materials have been provided in collaboration with the EcoStress Science Team at JPL. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions or if you have any feedback on appears. Subscribe to our listserv if you want to be the first to know about new EcoStress products and resources. Thanks. All right, well, thank you, Christine and Cole, for um, those great presentations. Um, before we jump into uh, the, the question and answer session, I just wanted to mention again um, that you can contact myself or my colleague Juan Torres Perez with any further questions. If you have general questions about the RCEP program, you can contact um, Anna Prados, who is our uh, program manager. And then once again, we've just listed the RSET website there where you can find um, not only uh, trainings on land applications, but other applications such as uh, water resources, disasters, uh, health and air quality, and wildfires. So I do really encourage you to take a look at the RSET website for other trainings that may be applicable to your work. So thank you all for being with us today. I hope you enjoyed our, our first lightning session. So as we transition over to um, the question and answer document, just a reminder that you can um, type your questions into um, the question box and we will um, get to them and post them onto our document and go through them as we receive them. Um, also, um, you may have seen within our chat to go ahead and provide um, your information if you would like to be connected to the broader group here. Um, we have hundreds of folks on from around the world. So if you would like to share your information, such as your name, your email address, where you're from, we will go ahead and respond to that. So it will be posted also in the, um, question box for others to see. Um, so that might be an opportunity for you all to connect with each other. Um, but do go ahead and post your questions into the question box and we will get to as many as we can. Thank you. So thank you everybody for joining us for our, our, our lightning webinar here today. And we have all the presenters on. If you have some questions and some people have been asking questions in the questions box, um, throughout the presentation, so we'll start with those first, but if you have any more, please feel free to write those in the question box, and we'll include this on this document. Uh, we'll transcribe the answers, and then we're going to make this PDF available after the fact for you to uh, look at in the future, as well as the recording of this training, which will be available on the training webpage within 24 hours of today. So, um, as I mentioned, we have uh, a couple of our guest presenters on here today to answer these questions. So we'll start off with uh, question one, um, and uh, I'll let you guys just go to it. If you see a question, uh, go ahead and just read it out loud, and then go ahead and, and answer the, the question. If there's anything you want to add, I'll just continue to type in what you say. Okay, great. So I think one of the first questions that came through uh, was what is PTJPL and what is Alexi? Um, and um, I'm assuming this person was just requesting some additional information on how uh, kind of the basis for how these different evapotranspiration models um, are implemented. And so um, I just put two quick summary, um, two quick summaries here. So PTJPL is a model that starts with a potential evapotranspiration, which is uh, defined as the amount of um, ET that would occur if there was a sufficient water source available. And so water availability would not be a limiting factor. Uh, and then PTJPL then applies um, numerous ecophysiological constraint functions 
um, including atmospheric conditions, moisture, and uh, vegetation indices, which then allow PET to be used to estimate ET. Uh, this model has been applied um, largely globally and more recently uh, regionally for um, applications users. Um, and uh, Alexi, uh, which was developed by the USDA, is a two-source energy balance model that partitions energy available at the land surface um, into turbulent fluxes of sensible and latent heat flux. Uh, and has been largely implemented over agricultural sites, though I have seen some um, recent implementations that are being conducted at a global scale. Um, but since I am not the develop primary science developers for these algorithms, I do suggest that you take a look at the algorithm theoretical basis documents that are on the EcoStress website. Um, each standard product is comes with an ATBD that explains exactly how that product was uh, developed or modeled. Um, and then uh, feel free to follow up with the science leads who are responsible for, for those standard products. Um, and so Glenn Hawley for LST and E, uh, Josh Fisher for level three PT and level four PT JPL based products and Martha Anderson um, for the Alexi and Diselexi products. Uh, okay, so I see the next question here is what is the temporal resolution? So we get this question a lot, um, and uh, I hope Cole uh, will um, chime in here as well. Um, but the temporal resolution for EcoStress is variable, um, and this is because we're, lo we're um, instrumented on the ISS, and so we are at the mercy of the ISS orbit. Um, and so you may have seen numerous tools out there that let you um, estimate or predict ISS overpass periods, um, but some of the some of those predictions may not hold true because of changes that are done to the orbit um, or to the ISS trajectory kind of in real time. For example, any time um, there is something that's docking to the ISS that will cause a slight change in the orbit that then results in a change in those predicted overpass or expected overpass times. Um, and because we're on the ISS, we also don't have um, an overpass time of day that is um, consistent. And so we've leveraged that variable overpass time to help us address our science question about diurnal variability. Uh, in general, however, um, we do pass over our priority target areas approximately every three to five days. Um, and in our kind of requirements type documents, we state at least weekly for those target areas. Um, so it's more like every three to five days, especially for areas like CONUS, um, but we say on the order of a week. Um, and then I see that Cole included here a link um, to more information about temporal and spatial resolution of EcoStress products. Um, I will, okay, so the third question here is how does the dip in the diurnal ET curve depend on, or does it depend on um, thresholds of air temperature and humidity? Um, and I did get a chance to uh, ping Josh Fisher about this during during the webinar, um, and his response was that because the uh, the dip is linked to the model closure, which is dependent on vegetation type and other environmental factors like soil moisture and atmospheric conditions. Um, the threshold then would likely be different based on these parameters and on vegetation type. Um, again, I would refer the um, person who asked this question to look at the ATBDs, um, but also feel free to follow up with Josh um, after, this, after this webinar as well. Uh, Cole, did you want to, I can keep going, but did you want to address any of the other questions? Uh, nope. <laughs> okay, uh, so the next question here is, uh, what is the EcoStress spatial coverage over Southern Africa? Um, and uh, Cole pasted this image of where our um, 
original kind of priority areas were for the EcoStress mission. But the amount of data that we've been acquiring is actually much greater than what's being shown on in this map. Um, and so if you want to take a look at where we've collected data, um, we've included a link here that gives you kind of the real-time statistics and coverage of the acquired scenes and where they are. Um, one thing that I'll note, though, is that not all of the data that has been acquired has been processed. And so if you look if you go to earthdata.nasa.gov, um, which is uh, kind of the, the portal that we talked about um, where you can access all of the publicly available EcoStress data sites, and these maps don't match up, feel free to get in touch with us um, and let us know that you're looking for data processed over a region that's not publicly available yet. Um, hearing your interest and demand in um, EcoStress products in areas where we don't have the data yet processed is really helpful for us. Um, in trying to get the, the resources needed to do that. Um, so we do actually, the updated map has a lot more sites covered. It has um, ocean sites that have begun to be covered as well. And so please do take a look at these tools and um, follow up with us. Uh, and there's also the, an EcoStress FAQ page um, that addresses a question that we get very common, uh, very often, which is, why are there no EcoStress observations that I can find over my specific study site? Um, okay, so the next question is, when will data be available with more global coverage? Um, so these are, so my last response is pretty related to this. Um, if there is a particular area that you're interested in, you know, again, feel free to check out the tools and then follow up with us. Um, we are also uh, limited by the ISS orbit. So you will see that there is a very clear cutoff above, um, um, above and below certain latitudes, um, 53 degrees south to 53 degrees north, uh, 0.6. Mm -hmm. um, but if your target sites fall within this boundary um, and you don't, See it already acquired, um, or you see that it's been acquired and not processed, again, feel free to follow up with us. There is some flexibility to submit requests for additional site acquisitions, but again, the ability to be able to process everything and make it available is, um, that has to be something that we follow up on as a project to make sure. So. Again, your feedback there is, is really helpful in helping us make that case. Um, is there, a, maybe this, so I think this question, Cole, if you can take it, that would be. Yep, okay. so is there a size limit to the area shape file that you submit to a peer? So there's not a specific limit to the size of an area shape file that you submit into the appear system. However, we do have some system constraints um, based on a request that you submit. So you can see here, we basically create an estimate of how big your request will be, and that's how we define um, these parameters. So a single file is limited to 7.2 gigabytes uh, output, that's per observation. Uh, total output request size can't exceed 450 gigabytes of data, and then the total number of output files is limited to 10,000 output files. Um, then that's for area requests. And then for point requests, uh, we limit users to 1,000 lat long um, coordinate uh, pairs or points per request, which can total up to 1 million rows or 1 million observations of data um, in the output CSV files. So there's not actually a limit on the um, size of a shape file that you can upload into a peers. Um, especially for some of our global products, we have users that will request you know, entire continents or even up to the entire globe. Um, for their for their data of interest. Let's see here. I can take the next question too. So, will EcoStress products data uh, be available in Google Earth Engine? So, we get this question actually pretty frequently at the LP deck with our different data products. Um, ultimately, that decision is up to Google. Um, the data are publicly available. If Google decides to go in um, and ingest the entire EcoStress data archive and make it available in Google Earth Engine. Um, that's not something that we have a collaboration with Google Earth Engine um, to do that. 
Uh, the, I'll, I will I'll quickly chime in on um, both six and seven. So um, one thing to note with um, making the subset request in appears is that, and Cole, you may have said this just now and I missed it, um, is that you know the more data you're requesting, so the larger that area shape file, the the longer that request might actually take to generate versus if you were requesting just a point extraction. Yes, that's a um, that's a great point. Uh, and then with question with respect to question seven, we have some informal discussions ongoing with Google. Um, to discuss whether there might be a possibility of a future um, larger scale um, ingestion of ego stress products. Um, Josh and Gregory and others are currently working on producing standard gridded products, um, but that won't necessarily be complete for, for some time. Um, and so the thought is that um, once those are available, that would make it a lot easier for Google Earth Engine to ingest and make available. Um, for, but for those of you who are interested in that functionality, um, feel free to follow up with us again, because um, the more interest that is expressed along these lines, the easier it is for us to have those conversations with Google and um, show what the value would be for for um, their users and the science community. Yeah, I think I'll add on to that too. Um, in terms of the time that it will take to uh, fulfill an eco stress request in appears currently, you do have to keep in mind that they are swath data, so we actually have to perform the resampling um, to a gridded uh, georeference output. So again, as Christine mentioned, the more data that you ask for, the longer it's gonna take us to perform all that resampling. However, um, as Christine alluded to, in the future with the gridded products, we will make those available in appears as well. And then um, you will see your request time definitely decrease um, due to the gridded nature of, of those products. So you, you'll be able to access those data faster, whether it's in appears or um, eventually possibly Google Earth Engine. Uh, um, okay, I'm looking at question eight. Um, and I will have to, so if that person can follow up with me on that question, I can direct you either to Josh or Martha, um, that they'll be better, um, fit to address that. Um, question nine, is there a way to query percent cloud cover? Um, there is a cloud mask um, product in the, I believe it's in the level two, but I don't think we have a standard way to do that as of yet. Um, yep, I so could, Carrie might actually have something that she uses on her end. Oh, and actually I'm thinking, so on the EcoStress website and some of those GMAP tools, we do have a percent cloud cover estimate um, kind of designation, but I don't know, uh, Cole, do you want to? Did you want to mention something there as well? Yeah, yeah, and maybe if you could provide that link for the users too, they might find that useful. But I was just going to add too. So as far as because I know other products, you guys are probably um, used to filtering by percent cloud cover in like Earth Data Search Client. Um, that functionality is not currently available for EcoStress. Um, however, if you are requesting EcoStress data via Appears, um, we do provide the quality layers. Um, including that cloud mask that Christine mentioned um, as an output, both in the quality visualizations and then also available for downloading your output um, download request. And so Appears will actually decode that cloud mask and provide quality lookup tables alongside your output data. So you could hypothetically download the QA data alongside your EcoStress data and then use Appears quality services or the quality lookup tables to prefer perform your own cloud or quality filtering mask on your own. And then I did put a link to one of our e-learning tutorials where this isn't specific to EcoStress, but you could use this um, for your workflow and then integrate EcoStress into it where we use an appears output and then mask and visualize um, outputs based on quality. Um, and I think like land cover type as well. So that could be a useful resource um, for you guys that are looking to to filter your eco stress data by quality or by cloud. 
Um, and I haven't um, interfaced with the with the Earth Explorer method for accessing EcoStress data, um, but there may be something there as well. Well, you know, I think we are coming to the end of our Q&A session here. I know our guest speakers um, have to move on some, to some other things here today. And uh, so I really hope that everybody that joined really enjoyed our, our lightning style training that was meant to just give a quick little um, introduction to EcoStress, the sensor, the applications, and a short tutorial, tutorial on how to access it. Uh, if you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out to myself, uh, Amber, Juan, or Christine, or Cole, and we can um, hopefully help you out with any of your other questions. Look for the PDF of this question and answer document to be available on the web page, as well as the, the recording of this that we make available on a YouTube channel by tomorrow. So Christine and Cole, thank you so much for everything that you provided for us here today. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yes, thanks to NASA RSET for hosting, and thanks, everyone, for listening. All right, thank you, everybody, and have a nice rest of your day. Bye. Bye.